and welcome to the Just and Sinner podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. And I just want to give you a reminder that we are donor supported as an organization at Just and Sinner. We do a lot more than this YouTube channel and this podcast. We provide Lutheran publications at as reasonable price as we possibly can to make them affordable and accessible. We also offer courses through the Widener Institute. You can find out all sorts of information about the things that we do by going to justandcenter.org, and you can find all of the different things that we do uh, as an organization. But we do need supporters. We need donors. So if you have benefited from the things that we do, we would ask that you would contribute. If you can't contribute yourself, we also have some materials that you can print off and give to others that you think might be interested in donating that tells them a little bit about who we are and why we are worth supporting. So you can find all of that at justincenter.org. You can go to the donate page and we have some things you can download as PDFs to print off or send via email or whatever else it might be. Well, on the program today, I am going to be playing the second of the talks that I gave at the ECHO conference in Denmark. This is on Sola Scriptura. So this is following the first talk on Sola Fide. We're discussing the solas of the Reformation. And so I hope you enjoy this talk. And if you have not yet, make sure you subscribe. Um, my tablet with my notes on it here may die during my talk, so I may be winging it in the second half. So... My goal is to have you uh, not notice, but now I just told you, so I guess you probably will. Uh, okay, so um, as we talked about last time, the, the solos of the Reformation can be useful, um, but we have to understand them in their proper context. And the solas of the Reformation can also be significantly misunderstood if they are applied without any context at all. And while certainly we could say the same, that is true about sola fide, as we talked about yesterday, uh, that's probably true about nothing as much as it is with sola scriptura. Um, this is one of those phrases that is a wonderful phrase, uh, one that is helpful in capturing the essence of the Reformation, but also one that is very, very often um, either misunderstood or uh, sometimes I think probably purposefully misrepresented, honestly. Um, so I'm gonna start with some mischaracterizations that you often hear about uh, sola scriptura. Now I encounter this regularly when I deal um, with Roman Catholic converts, uh, and maybe some of you have some of those very young, very zealous uh, traditionalist Roman Catholic converts that seem to want to uh, spend all of their time blaming Sola Scriptura for all of the problems in the world. Uh, and I encounter this a bit. <laughs> so when, when you hear someone who criticizes Lutheranism, and they're probably just including you with broad Protestantism and sticking absolutely everything they possibly can into that category, uh, the criticism first is, you know, you guys with your Sola Scriptura, you're saying that you need the Bible and you don't need anything else for any reason at all and therefore, you are all just your own popes. So the option is either you listen to the pope, you listen to the Bishop of Rome and his interpretation of scripture, or everybody is less left to him or herself to just kind of try to figure out exactly what the Bible means. And so you just kind of, I don't know, maybe you know, sit alone in a room with your Bible somewhere and read through it and try to figure out what it means. And so that means that everyone can just decide for him or herself what the Bible actually means. You may have heard this criticism before. And, you know, we've probably, you've probably encountered somebody in your life, and I've encountered plenty of people like this in my life, who uh, read the Bible and come away with some very bizarre interpretations of certain things. Uh, <laughs> and... When you look at people like that and you take this criticism and you say, okay, well, I certainly know people that have read the Bible and come up with some weird conclusions. Not everybody really is trained in an understanding of church history or the creeds or um, how to interpret the Bible rightly. So how can anybody know what the Bible actually means? Well, another criticism that we find that I hear often is that if you believe in sola scriptura, you don't even have any way of knowing exactly what is in the Bible. Have you heard this before? You know, in other words, the table of contents in your Bible is not divinely inspired. It's not there in the Bible. It comes from the Roman Catholic Church telling you what books are in the Bible. That's the, that's the criticism. 
So I'm going to, I want to counter those uh, oppositions to sola scriptura that you often hear. And I want to say first that sola scriptura does not mean that we believe in what they call private interpretation of scripture. In other words, interpretation of scripture that is devoid of the wisdom of the church or the creeds of the church or the authority structures in the church, such as pastors. Also, I want to say that accepting the tradition that is the books that are in the canon of scripture, in other words, knowing which books are inspired, does not mean that we have to accept the authority of the Roman Catholic Church or the authority of any self-proclaimed uh, you know, tradition uh, or uh, receiver and interpreter of tradition, such as the Roman Magisterium, but not exclusive with the Roman Magisterium. So, with that, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, some history here, as I did in the last talk, talking about sola fide. As, as I said, it's really important to understand the solas within the particular contexts of the debates that are actually happening that lead to the formation of these terms. Because it's when we use these terms out of that historical context that they are often, most often misunderstood. So, we're going to be talking first about the early church. So, the question I have here is, when you look at the early church, I want to ask, what is it that the earliest Christians are using as their authority to interpret what exactly is true, or to decide what exactly is true in the Christian faith, what might be called dogma? So the question is, when we look at the earliest Christian writings, are they proclaiming truth on the basis of the revealed word of God in Scripture, or are they proclaiming that which is true based on some kind of inherited tradition from, say, the Bishop of Rome? In other words, do we find early Christians in theological debates, in, in trying to find answers to those debates or solutions, do we find them going to the Bishop of Rome and saying, Bishop of Rome, we can't interpret the Bible. You are uh, on the chair of St. Peter and you can interpret the Bible for us. Please answer this controversy for us. What is it that the early Christians are looking at as the authoritative source to answer theological disputes? Because that really is the question that we are asking with Sola Scriptura. We are asking the question, what is it that the church goes to ultimately and finally to settle its theological disputes? Do we go to the revealed word of God in scripture? Or do we go to both the revealed word of God as well as some kind of authoritative church tradition? And when you're taking that second approach, which is the Roman Catholic approach, I would also say that I think often within that approach, what really ends up happening is that you're not really looking at the scriptural answer at all, but what you're looking at is the answer in tradition. Because after all, we need tradition to interpret scripture in that perspective. So ultimately the final say is really whatever the church said. And that determines how it is that we interpret uh, the text of scripture. So what do the early Christians do? Well. Controversies are present within the church, theological controversies, since its inception. We have theological controversies in the New Testament. There are quite a few of them. Uh, the Apostle Paul in particular deals with many of those. In the book of Colossians, he deals with a, a group that is often known as kind of proto-Gnostics, this early uh, Christian group that prizes some kind of secret wisdom, talks about offering some kind of adoration to angels, and there are all sorts of other things that are going on here. Uh, we have a group that is known as the Judaizers, which is a group that shows up in the book of Galatians. And the Judaizers start teaching that there is a necessity for all Christians to be circumcised, as well as to partake of Jewish food laws. Well, after the time of the New Testament, controversies don't go away. They increase significantly after the deaths of the apostles. And one of those early groups that gains prominence, the one that gains the most prominence very early, is a group called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics are a group that uh, is, well, it, it's not even a unified group. There are a bunch of different groups called Gnostics. Gnostic comes from the word gnosis, which means knowledge. And essentially, the Gnostics believe that we grow in the faith through the acquisition of kind of secret knowledge, 
And they have this whole schema of salvation, this way of understanding salvation, that salvation is really about knowing more and about kind of uh, transcending the self or going beyond yourself to become something else. So they have this uh, order of being and in this understanding you have God is like the highest or greatest of all beings and then you have these different orders of angels and some are greater than others and then there's humans not quite at the bottom But the goal of salvation is basically to kind of climb up this ladder higher and higher, become a kind of higher type of being through this uh, growth or acquisition of knowledge. Well, in, in light of that group and the widespread nature of those ideas, early Christians had to start writings, had to write writings that were going to counter those ideas and show that they were mistaken. Um, The most famous of these Uh, in the early church is a book called Against Heresies by St. Irenaeus. And if you don't know St. Irenaeus, um, Irenaeus was a, he was a couple generations after the apostles. So St. Irenaeus knew Polycarp. Polycarp was taught by the apostle John. So when you look at someone like St. Irenaeus, he's a couple generations removed from the apostles. And if you're looking at somebody who would really be able to give you kind of an authoritative apostolic tradition, right? a tradition directly from the apostles, Irenaeus would be a great person to go to because Irenaeus actually could say that he had an inherited tradition. I mean, he could have heard stories from his own teacher about what the apostles said, and, and he has some, uh, at least one interesting one about uh, the apostle John encountering one of the early heretics named Martian in the church. So what Irenaeus does in his debates with the Gnostics is that he does speak about apostolic tradition. And he does counter the Gnostic traditions. And the Gnostics, by the way, claimed that the teachings that they had were actually secret teachings of Jesus himself. But they weren't in the Gospels. They showed up other places. And they were passed on kind of secretly. So then you have this, you have someone like Irenaeus who knows the teaching of the apostles, and you have the Gnostics who claim to be teaching what the apostles are teaching. And when you look at somebody like that, you could say, okay, when someone's talking about authoritative tradition and they actually like are a couple generations removed from the apostles, you can make probably a pretty good case. I think probably more so than someone within, say, the Roman tradition today. Um, and if you look at what Irenaeus defines as the tradition that is set against the Gnostic tradition, what Irenaeus puts together is something very similar to what we know today as the Apostles' Creed. And the significance of this is that what Irenaeus basically comes up with as the inherited or received tradition is all just things that are explicitly taught in Holy Scripture. What Irenaeus brings forth as the apostolic tradition that is authoritative and that is being passed on is not something that is um, separate from what we find in Holy Scripture, which is quite different from the way that Irenaeus' writings end up being used much later to justify something like, say, the bodily assumption of Mary, the idea that uh, the Virgin Mary was you know, bodily assumed into heaven, or something like that, that clearly has no uh, bearing in scripture at all. So what we see is that the earliest Christians do use language of tradition, but when they define tradition, they're defining tradition really as things that are also clearly taught within the word of God, not, not some kind of separate dogma or separate theological claims that have no basis in the word of God. Well, let's go to another theological debate. Uh, if you look at the, the early church and look at the most heated theological debates, the Gnostics show up first, and then the one that you're going to look at after that that's most significant that leads to the writing of the Nicene Creed is the Arian debate. So within the Arian debate, you have a group known as the Arians and following a guy named Arius. The Arians argue that Jesus had a beginning that Jesus, as the Son of God, the eternal Logos, was not actually eternal in the fullest sense. So the second person of the Trinity, according to the Arians, was the first and greatest creation of the Father, but was a creation nonetheless. Now against this, Athanasius, this is the most significant figure here, though he's not even the first to fight against the Arians, Uh, but Athanasius writes a number of treatises against the Arians, arguing that, no, the second person of the Trinity the Son, the Logos, is eternal with the Father and with 
um, the, the Holy Spirit, and we have another debate about the Holy Spirit that comes after this. Um, this debate rages for centuries, really. When you tend to think about this, or you kind of first learn about this in a kind of a basic church history overview, you may get the idea that, well, you had this debate between you know, Athanasius and Arius, and then you had the Council of Nicaea, 325. The Council of Nicaea made a decision in favor of Athanasius. That's where we get the Nicene Creed. The Arians are condemned, and end of controversy. It's not how it works at all. Uh, there are actually, after the Council of Nicaea, a number of counter-councils that meet to overthrow the decisions of Nicaea. And you've got raging debates for centuries between the Arians and then the Nicene Christians. And actually, throughout much of Europe, Christianity is going to be dominated in certain places uh, by the Arians. So there are a couple things that I think we can draw from this debate in terms of how we're, how we're dealing with this question of sola scriptura and the question of authority. The first of these is this. If you look at the debates between, say, Athanasius and Arius, or different Nicenes and different Arians, and you ask the question, what is it that those figures are using as their primary source of argument to defend their points? And I think that a, a read of Athanasius makes it very clear that they're arguing on the basis of Scripture. Athanasius does not claim you know, authoritative teaching from the Bishop of Rome. Nobody goes to the Bishop of Rome and says, hey, uh, can you deal with this question for us? What are we supposed to do? What tradition should we hold to? It just doesn't happen. If you read Athanasius' works against the Arians, he is just expositing scripture. He's looking at the text, trying to explain the text, trying to demonstrate how the text shows his point, and the Arians do the same things. Now, it is the case that they do cite some earlier authorities. They do cite earlier Christian writers, as they should, just as any theologian today, uh, any good theologian today, is going to also cite earlier trusted authorities, as we've been doing throughout this, and will continue to do throughout this series here, looking at somebody like, you know, an Athanasius. But I think it's clear when you read those writings that these earlier authors that are cited really are uh, used in a kind of supplementary uh, capacity. In other words, they're not the foundation of the argument. The foundation of the argument is always the text of Scripture. And other figures or authorities are used secondarily. So uh, I think th the one point we can make in terms of sola scriptura, looking at the early church, is when we ask the question, what is that you know, authoritative source that they're using as uh, having primacy in these debates? If you look at someone like Athanasius, I think it's clear that they're functioning on a principle that would be quite similar to what we would say today or label today as sola scriptura, even though he doesn't use that particular phrase. But there's no reason to think that he should be using that particular phrase. Um, though it, there are some citations from early fathers that do use something more similar to uh, that, that kind of phrase. Of course, Ath Athanasius is also um, you know, not necessarily writing in Latin. So, um, and many of the fathers are writing in in Greek at this time, so you're not going to expect to have the Latin phrases in particular. But the other thing that's, uh, I think, really important here is that when you look at the question of what is it that, how is it that the church looked at the councils? So if you look at something like the Council of Nicaea, the question is, did the church at the time believe that the Synod of Nicaea was necessarily the final arbiter of what was actually true. When we look at Nicaea today, we do consider it one of the ecumenical councils, and I think rightly so. There's a reason why we uh, honor Nicaea and not these anti-Nicene uh, councils that happen afterwards, because I think Nicaea was correct. But the understanding of Nicaea as what we call an ecumenical council actually took some time to really develop. It's not the understanding at the time that whatever happened in this council was necessarily declaratively true forever because of the authority of a church council. And we see that with the other councils that met afterwards and, and how these things were treated. 
And again, there is no appeal to the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome actually doesn't have really any significant role within the Council of Nicaea at all. It's not really until Pope Leo with Chalcedon that the Bishop of Rome has any significant uh, say within uh, these you know, ecumenical councils. All right, so let's then look a little bit briefly at what happens in the medieval period. Because as I said, when we're looking at these solas, we need to understand them in the late medieval context because there are particular late medieval controversies that are being addressed or answered by the development of these phrases. Well, I within the medieval church, you start to see increased development of traditions that are not clearly taught in scripture. So as I said, in the early church, you do have people like Irenaeus speaking about traditions that are authoritative, but when you ask what are those traditions, they are very clearly traditions that are truths of scripture summarized rather than things that are extra biblical. They have no basis in, in supernatural revelation and scripture at all. But within the medieval church, as we talked about some of those developments yesterday, when you look at something like, say, the treasury of merits or indulgences, you really have no scriptural basis for those teachings in any way at all. So there is this shift away from a focus on scriptural exegesis of looking at the text of scripture as the primary role of the theologian towards then this citation of earlier authorities. And this really begins in the early medieval period with Emperor Charlemagne. Uh, under Emperor Charlemagne, you have a, a very significant theologian, though not one that's probably that well known, named Alswin of York. And Alswin starts to compile particularly the sayings of St. Augustine and other earlier church fathers and putting them together in these kind of little manuals of sayings of the fathers. And they're wonderful, by the way. Alswin is great. And he does the same with prayers as well. And there's certainly nothing wrong with what's going on there. But what you see is it's clear that the early medieval period did not have the brilliant theological minds that the earlier church did. You don't have quite an Augustine at that age. Uh, now, there, not that there were no significant thinkers at all, but because of that, there is this focus more toward looking back at the earlier writers than new theologians developing, say, commentaries based on the text of scripture. You still have some. You've got people like the Venerable Bede, a very great example, uh, Lupus de Ferrier. You have some others. Um, but because you have these manuals that are largely citations of earlier authorities, the question of what is theologically true really starts to center a little more on questions like, well, what did Augustine say about this? Now, if you're going to take anybody in the early church and use them as authoritative, Augustine's probably a pretty safe bet. Not Jerome. See there, I could... I told you I'd say something about Jerome today. No. <laughs> but Augustine becomes kind of the authoritative source. And, I mean, if you're going to grab anybody in the early church, Augustine's probably the best, the best place to go. Um, but this becomes more... It becomes, uh, actually it comes farther from Augustine when you start to do things like uh, look at the development of medieval purgatory. Um, so remember that 1054 is the date where you have the East and the West split in the church. Now, the Eastern church has never taught something like purgatory. There's this weird toll houses idea that shows up somewhere that's even wackier than purgatory. It's really, really bizarre, but it's not even universal. Um, so you see that some of these things that are taught in the later Middle Ages that you think of as really foundational for what you think of as Roman Catholicism, they're not official teachings of the entire church because they never even developed at all in the Eastern church. Now, as these ideas develop and the power of the papacy grows in the Western church, people do start to ask the questions, well, if we believe these teachings are authoritative, such as purgatory, such as the treasury of merits, what is the relationship between what's revealed in scripture and the authority of the Pope? Because clearly we have these traditions that are not explicitly taught in scripture. And in the early, uh, you know, 1000s, 1100, uh, that kind of era, you still don't really have a developed idea of how scripture and tradition relate to one another. So as one example, Bernard of Clairvaux, and Bernard of Clairvaux's years are 1090 to 1153. Bernard of Clairvaux is, as Martin Luther said, the greatest of the monks. 
uh, Martin Luther liked to call Bernard of Clairvaux the uh, Pater Bernardus, Father Bernard, because he loved him so much. Um, but there's a, a interesting, just very brief note that you find in Bernard. And I actually tried to trace this down, and I encountered this back in college, and I, I was not able to find the exact source of this, so I apologize for that. Um, but Bernard is talking about the Apostles' Creed in one place, and in his discussion of the Apostles' Creed, he gets into the question of the descent into hell. And there, Bernard says, I don't see this taught in scripture, this descent into hell. Now, we do, and this is an issue dealt with in the Formula of Concord in the Lutheran Confessions. But as Bernard is discussing that, he asks, well, why is it that we believe in the descent to hell if it's not clearly taught in scripture? And Bernard says, well, maybe there is something authoritative about tradition alongside of scripture. What's interesting about that particular passage, and again, I tried to trace it down and find it, and I could not locate it, so I'm sorry. But what, what was interesting in that passage is that it shows that there just isn't, by Bernard's time, a clearly identified approach to the question of how scripture and tradition relate to each other. So right now we're talking, you know, we're talking like 11... 53, you know, he, he dies. So we are, uh, you know, 400 years less than that before the Reformation, and there still is no clearly defined approach to how the relationship between Scripture and tradition functions. So there really is no definitive statement in the Western Church at all about the relationship between Scripture and tradition until the Reformation really itself. This is the first time that the debate has really forced the Church to identify how these things relate. Now, you have ideas related to that that do certainly show up in things like the Fourth Lateran Council and some of the other Western councils, but it's not clearly set forth until you get the Reformation and then Rome at the Council of Trent defines the relationship between scripture and, and tradition in the way that it does. Now, what is the common, though, medieval approach by Luther's time? Generally, it's taught, and I think this is clearly what's taught at Trent, but there's debate about this, uh, that there are two basic streams of authority. In other words, you have two sources of revelation. You have scripture, which is a source of revelation that is, we're going to say certainly is primary, but within the medieval church, there's scripture, and then there also is tradition. And the idea here is some doctrines are taught in scripture, and other doctrines are passed on via tradition. It's very clear when you read Trent, the Council of Trent, but also a lot of late medieval theologians, that the understanding is that whatever authoritative traditions the medieval church taught at that time were taught by the apostles directly and were passed on by word of mouth by the apostles through the church and had been continually received and taught. So take something like the bodily assumption of Mary. Now that, that, particular teaching is very late. It's 1950. It's declared a dogma. Dogma within Rome means you are required to believe it. It's not just a, what they call a pious opinion, meaning it's not just something that Christians can believe, but it's something that you are absolutely required to believe as a Christian. So say the bodily assumption of Mary was a dogma in the medieval church, and it wasn't, like I said, not until 1950. Well, it certainly was the understanding within the medieval church that something like the bodily assumption of Mary then, if it was dogma, would have been something that the apostles taught and they taught their successors and they taught their successors. It just was never written down anywhere. It becomes pretty difficult when you've got, you know, six, seven hundred years where this tradition apparently was believed by all sorts of people but just never written down. Now, this is defined today as a partim partim approach to the authority of tradition. That, the, that what we receive as revelation is partly scripture and partly tradition. Much of Rome tries to depart from that today and tries to teach uh, another approach that's called material sufficiency, where they try to focus more so on Scripture having basically all the material you need for revelation, but tradition more interprets scripture than actually passes on things that are totally divorced from scripture. I don't think that's what's taught in the medieval period, and I don't think that's at all what's taught in Trent. Now, as this developed in the me medieval period, it's believed that scripture is essentially too obscure to be understood on its own. Very clearly not what is practiced in the early church. 
people are reading scripture, they're debating scripture out in the open. But at this time, uh, scripture is generally perceived to be kind of a dim light. We don't really have any way to understand scripture apart from the authoritative light of the tradition of Rome as passed on especially through the papacy. And Luther you know, encounters this a lot. Uh, he has a really great discussion of this question at the beginning of the bondage of the will where Luther addresses Erasmus. And one could certainly debate that Luther is maybe a little too harsh to Erasmus at some points in that introduction, but, uh, but he has a really great uh, discussion of this and the fact that scripture defines itself as a light, right, which enlightens our path. It's not just this obscure book that nobody can really understand without, you know, a proper theological degree or without the necessary authoritative tradition as is passed down within the canons of the Roman tradition. And scripture becomes more and more obscure in the medieval mind. The more canon law develops, the more medieval traditions develop. and, And there are kind of layers upon layers upon layers of canons and papal decrees that make scripture seem far more obscure because you have to read it through the lens of so much other stuff. We're not just talking here about things like the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian Creed. So generally, if scripture is obscure, that also means that it is limited in its reading to teachers of the church. You have plenty of clergy that are not reading the text of scripture at all. They don't really have any scripture to preach from. And this means then that scripture in some ways or the teachings of the church compared to scripture remains relatively unchallenged because a lot of people just don't have access to it. And the people that do have access to the scriptures are those who have those kind of authoritative ch- teaching, or, uh, yeah, teaching positions within the church. Well, this is ultimately, I think, what happens here is that though the claim has certainly always been within Rome that both scripture and tradition are authorities. So they want to uphold the the authority of scripture. If scripture is obscure, and the only way to properly understand the obscure teachings of scripture is through the tradition of the church or the magisterium of the church, then what really becomes your ultimate authority? The magisterium, right? Because the magisterium is the only thing through which you can really understand scripture at all. So even though the, ch- the church does and still does claim that both of those are kind of equal authorities in some way, you're really reading one through the lens of the other. And that I think becomes the problem. So some people like to say that in practice what happens is a kind of sola ecclesi- ecclesia, which is the, you know, the church alone really is the authoritative determiner of doctrine, not scripture at all. And well, the church would never claim that, I do think that there is some validity to that criticism in actual practice. Certainly, certainly in this period, um, and maybe somewhat different today, but um, in some ways not. I guess it kind of depends. It's hard to, Rome is not unified today, so a lot of these criticisms, every time I think about them, I'm like, well, it would be valid with this group, but not necessarily with this group within Rome. Looks like the, the motion sensor is off again here. I, th- I think maybe I should stand closer to the sensor on the other side here. Uh, okay. Well, we essentially have, when we're looking at the question of the authority of Scripture, really three different views that we could hold to, and the churches do hold to. First, we have the idea that Scripture and tradition are equally authoritative. So that's the Roman Catholic view. The Eastern Orthodox view could be said to be the same. In some ways, though, the Eastern Church tends to say, really, it's tradition that's authoritative, holy tradition, and scripture is really part of that holy tradition. So it doesn't quite function in exactly the same way. The East also does not have this developed system whereby new dogmas are consistently added to the church and can be defined by some authoritative force like the Roman papacy. Uh, so I- in many ways, what I'm talking about today can apply to the East, but it wouldn't exactly be fair, I think, to apply all the criticisms that we're dealing with with Rome to the Eastern church. It's a bit of a different, a different thing. Okay, the second approach would be this, that scripture is the sole authority in every sense, and that's the end of story. We see this with, for example, the restorationist groups, 
sometimes known as the Campbellites. So they're groups in the 19th century that essentially say, uh, not only is tradition to be submitted under scripture, but they say, well, tradition really as a whole is, uh, it, it's a hindrance to our understanding of scripture. So the best way to read the Bible is to get rid of all creeds and all tradition and all confessions altogether and just go back to the Bible alone. This is really, I think, that caricature that you find, that misunderstanding of Roman Catholics when they hear Sola Scriptura, they often think about this, you know, me and my Bible and Jesus alone in my room. And that's, that's it, end of story. And there are certainly Christians who take that approach. However, that approach is not at all what Sola Scriptura means in the Reformation sense. So what is the other approach then? The third, and this is the one I'm going to say is the correct one. Uh, this is how the Lutheran reformers dealt with this question. Is this, scripture is infallible. Scripture is the inspired word of God. It is unique. Tradition is upheld as a secondary authority insofar as it is consistent with scripture. This means that we're not getting rid of tradition. We're not even saying that tradition is not an authority. However, that authority is subsumed under and submitted to the greater authority, which is the text of scripture. And so this is not to throw away tradition, but it's to say that tradition does not have the final say. So if you come across a tradition that contradicts the word of God, instead of trying to kind of squeeze the word of God or make all sorts of weird categories to somehow try to make it fit with your tradition, which I think is what Rome has often done historically, then we say, look, when we've got a competition between scripture and the word of God, or sorry, scripture as the word of God and tradition, we go with scripture. Here's an example. I think this is an obvious example, so it's the one I always use, and that is uh, communion in both kinds. In the medieval church, and this is a very, very late development, there was a lot of superstition that developed around the sacrament of the Eucharist to such an extent that there was this fear of spilling the blood of Christ so that it was taught that only the priest should consume the blood of Christ and the lay person should just not receive it at all. Now, there are a lot of developments that have to happen for this to even make any sense at all. Uh, this has zero precedent within the church fathers. I think they would be shocked and horrified that the church was doing this. And this has no precedent in scripture whatsoever. I mean, Jesus talks about the sacrament. What does he say? Take, eat, take, drink. I mean, the instructions are pretty darn simple. You think you'd be able to follow them, all right? So you're disagreeing with the very basis of the command that is the sacrament in the text of scripture. They're also disagreeing with the entire early church in doing this practice. It's really just kind of, the authority of the magisterium. It's not even really tradition in the sense of what the fathers taught, as often it's actually not, but here is a very clear example where you have the entirety of scripture and the entirety of the testimony of the church fathers on one side and the pope on the other. We don't go with the pope <laughs> when we've got that competition, okay? This is what it means that scripture is our sole authority. What we're saying is it's our sole infallible authority. It's our sole God-breathed authority. There is nothing that has the kind of authority that scripture has. And this is the way that authority functions in the church in relation to, say, you know, your pastor. You shouldn't go into church every Sunday and with your Bible open, listening to your pastor, waiting to correct everything that he says that morning because you may think that the Bible means something else. Right. You, you, don't, you don't come to your pastor with the immediate questioning of his authority. Like, I want to challenge you. No, you come to church, hopefully, to hear the word of God proclaimed by the mouth of your pastor. Now, if your pastor starts to say something that seems very inconsistent with the word of God, what do you do? Do you just submit to your pastor because he's your pastor? No. Then you do submit to the word of God if there is a disagreement but you come with the assumption that the authority of my pastor is good and true, though not unchallenged. That's the way that we should approach tradition as well. So again, we, we also have that other question of <laughs> what exactly is tradition? And this is, I think, where Rome often fails because what they define as tradition often is actually not the tradition of the early church. 
Sometimes it is, but often it is not. You, f you don't find anywhere this idea of withholding of the cup from the laity in the early church. You don't find the bodily assumption of Mary in the early church. You don't find the immaculate conception of Mary in the early church. Uh, you don't find the dogma of papal infallibility in the early church. I mean, you could go on and on and on and on. There are many things that are declared dogma that actually don't have any roots in tradition. It's just traditions that they happen to grab onto. Um, and many of them being very late in the medieval period, some even after that. I mean, papal infallibility isn't declared dogma until 1870. So what does it mean then in terms of how scripture functions within a sola scriptura context? Well, first, we understand that scripture is unique in its nature and function. There is nothing that has the nature and function of scripture. So uh, it is theopneustas, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. It is breathed out by God or God breathed. It is inspired by the Spirit as the very word of God, 2 Peter 2, 20 through 21. As Jesus says, Scripture cannot be broken, John 10, 35. Those kinds of things are not true of anything else outside of the text of Scripture. Now, what does Scripture then say about tradition and the church? Well, Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.15 that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And some Roman Catholics will quote that and say, there you go. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Therefore, sola scriptura is wrong. And by the church, he means the uh, successors of St. Peter, who are the bishops of Rome. Clearly, Paul says nothing like that. There's no indication that that has anything to do with what he's saying. Why is it that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth? Is there anything that indicates it has anything to do with the Roman Catholic magisterial authority? No. St. Irenaeus uses this phrase and actually rephrases it in Finding Against the Gnostics and says that scripture is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Is that a contradiction to St. Paul? No. Why is the church the pillar and foundation of the truth? Because the church is the organization that God has created on this earth and we could talk about the nature of its structure, but um, that is to be led and guided by and to preserve the word of God. In other words, it is the foundation of the truth because it is the place where scripture is taught and preserved. Now, also scripture does talk about traditions. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, 1 Corinthians eleven two, 2, that there are traditions that the apostles tell people to uphold uphold the traditions that I have handed on to you. Does this mean that there is some kind of infallible authority within church tradition? Well, nothing the apostles say here gives any indication that the traditions they passed on are then that which is going to be preserved under the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Now, if you look at the churches that claim to have the authoritative traditions as passed on from the apostles, you don't just have Rome. Rome is the biggest. Rome is certainly uh, the most prominent within the Western world, but they're not the only one. You find this within the Eastern churches and you find it within the non-Chalcedonian Eastern churches, within the, the Coptic churches, within the Ethiopian church. You find this within the uh, you know, Syrian church of the East or the Nestorian church. So there is still that question of, even if you're going to say tradition is authoritative, what tradition are you identifying here as authoritative? Well, the apostles could say that. Why could they say that? Because the apostles were those who were sent by God directly to proclaim the authoritative word of God. Apostolic teaching is what is authoritative. The question is, how, where do we find apostolic teaching today? There's no question that apostolic teaching was authoritative in the early church. And in the early church, that was delivered by the word of mouth because, you know, you have the apostles directly there. And it was delivered through the written word of God. Sola Scriptura does not mean that in every era and every age of the church, it is scripture alone that has functioned as that God-breathed authority. Because we recognize in the Old Testament, God sent prophets. And when the prophet Isaiah spoke, he spoke the word of God. The people of Israel didn't have to stop and say, we're going to wait till he raises it down, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, okay, so in the life of the apostles, of course, that's the same way. And scripture is being written. It's in the process of being, you know, uh, brought from one church to another. 
when, even when you get to the second century, you find congregations, most of them don't have the entirety of the New Testament. It takes time for books to be copied and circulate. So the question is not, are the apostolic traditions authoritative? The question is, where do we find apostolic tradition today? Do we find it within the Roman Catholic tradition and scripture or one or the other or some other tradition? Or is it that scripture is where we find the apostolic tradition today? And that's what I'm saying the sola scriptura position is, is understanding that yes, of course the traditions were authoritative taught by the apostles, but where do we find them today? We find those in the written word of God. Now, we have here in scripture, a particular passage I think is really important for explaining how it is that traditions function within, in relation to the text of scripture. And that's what we find in uh, Mark chapter seven. We have this instance where there is an encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees, and the Pharisees critique Jesus and his apostles, the disciples, because they do not wash their hands before they eat. Now it's not just a, you know, dealing with germs, I mean, we may want to wash our hands before we eat. You probably should, but for other reasons than what the Pharisees are claiming. This was a, a passed on tradition, that there was a ritual necessity that everyone washed their hands prior to eating a meal with one another. And this is part of a broader critique of Jesus and his disciples. It's not just this particular uh, incident that there are critiques that Jesus is not always following the oral traditions passed on by uh, the Pharisees. Now, what is Jesus' response when they rebuke him? And he says, he, he re refers to those traditions as traditions of men, and then he accuses them of disobeying the word of God for the sake of their traditions. So he sets, Jesus himself sets up the standard of You've got traditions of men, and then you have the word of God. And when there's a contradiction, you forsake the traditions of men. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't respect traditions, by the way. Jesus does things like he seems to have celebrated Hanukkah. Uh, Jesus teaches at the synagogue. Was the synagogue ever divinely commanded? No. There's not, no passage in the Old Testament that says, thou shalt make a synagogue. Jesus respects and honors the tradition. He even says that the Pharisees, he says they sit in Moses' seat. Like he respects, they have, they have a position of authority. They're abusing it though, but he doesn't deny that. So Jesus is a, both a respecter of tradition and also a critic of tradition when it opposes the word of God. Now, why I think that's particularly relevant to dealing with especially Roman Catholic arguments today is if you look at the canon of scripture, right, which books are included in the Bible? The Roman Catholic argument, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is the only way that we know what books are actually included in scripture. How do we know that we include Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and not one of the Gnostic Gospels? But they're going to say the only way that you know that is because the Roman Catholic Church told you that and they determined what books are in the Bible. Therefore, this proves that the Roman Catholic Church both gave you the Bible and also is an authority that God has established to teach whatever it wants to teach, and you have to submit to it. If you look at the canon of the Old Testament, and you're going to apply that same argument, you're going to come away with the conclusion that the Pharisaic traditions are infallible, and we should submit to all of them. We actually have, within the first century, a couple of different canons of the Old Testament. We have the Sadducees, and the Sadducees held to the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the, the, the Torah, the books of the law, but did not hold to the broader Old Testament canon, which you know, included the later prophets. The Pharisees held to the canon of the Old Testament that we have today, that we accept today. If you were a Jew living in the first century and you held to the Pharisaic canon, does that mean that you had to hold to the entirety of all Pharisaical traditions? Because that's Rome's argument, right? If you agree with us on what the canon is, you therefore trust that we are a spiritual authority over you and you have to trust all of our teachings. The Pharisees could have made the same argument. 
So, in light of that, I think it is very fair to take Jesus' application of tradition with the Pharisees and say, we can apply that as well today. And with that, we have to distinguish between kinds of traditions. I'm going to finish here in a minute because I want to have a little bit of time for questions. But if, we, if we're talking about traditions, we have to define what exactly do we mean. And this is something that gets lost in these discussions is Rome often says, okay, if you say tradition is good or tradition is authoritative, then that means the Roman Catholic tradition. Why? Why, why are we granting that? I, I don't grant that. What is tradition? What kind of tradition are you talking about? And uh, Martin Chemnitz, the great second generation Lutheran reformer, gives us a distinction between many different kinds of tradition to say, we've got to define what the heck we're even talking about here. There is no just tradition in the abstract that somehow means the teaching of the Pope. Well, I'm not gonna go through that, the, all of the distinctions that he makes here, different kinds of traditions, but I'm just gonna mention a few of them here. One is, there is the tradition which is the inherited tradition of which books are included in the Old and New Testaments. That is one kind of tradition. I am fine accepting that tradition. I don't think we need to take the books of the New Testament with total skepticism and say, well, I don't know. We just kind of happened to try to figure it out, uh, what was what and which books were included in the canon. God is not going to inspire a bunch of books to be you know, the infallible uh, teaching materials for the church and then just leave it up to the church to try to guess. So I would say, yes, I submit to those traditions. I just don't give it to Rome that that's their tradition. God certainly led the church to recognize which books were in the canon, just as in the same way the first century Jews could have actually known what books were inspired in the Old Testament without somehow having to submit to the traditions which are the teachings of the Pharisees in toto. There are also traditions that are inherited language, inherited phrases that summarize the teachings of Scripture. These are the traditions that are the ecumenical creeds. Uh, within our own Lutheran tradition, these are what we find in our Lutheran confessions. There are certain inherited ways of speaking about the truths of Scripture, categorizing the truths of Scripture that are not additional teaching up on top of Scripture, that adds some kind of new dogma. Do we receive those traditions? Yes. There are traditions that are days and practices of worship. Things like celebrating the day of Easter or Christmas or the different elements of our worship service that are inherited traditions. Do we receive those traditions? Yes, as long as they do not contradict the word of God. Look at Luther's German Mass in the era of the Reformation, there was a reception of what was the developed medieval mass, but there were changes made when those traditions contradicted the word of God, uh, namely the canons relating to the nature of Eucharistic sacrifice, as well as prayers, you know, Marian prayers and um, other devotions to the saints. Then we have this fourth kind of tradition that I'm identifying here. We could break these down further. And that is the traditions that are additional doctrines which are not in any way revealed in Scripture. That we reject. So we have to distinguish between all of these kinds of traditions to say what exactly are we talking about. So what sola scriptura means and is trying to identify is that last kind of tradition. To say that Tradition does not have the authority to add some kind of additional doctrine that my conscience is now uh, bound to believe that has no basis in the word of God. That's what we reject. All right, well, um, I have some other stuff here, but I know I can't get through the entirety of my notes because I do want to have a little bit of time for questions. So I think we've got about 10 minutes here if we're going to stick to our hour time limit. So we've got a couple questions on... Tradition, Sola Scriptura. Looks like we got one back here. Um, well, you know, uh, the Catholic Church says that they have, like, the authority of tradition and, and they have a say in this. Yeah. But, and I'm not a historian, but don't the Orthodox ch Church has an equal right in that, you know, they, as far as I know, like, they branched off at equal times. Right. So 
couldn't the Orthodox Church say, but we have an equal authority to say what tradition is? Why do the Catholics say that <laughs> Right. they have it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. And, and I think they do have an equal claim, for sure. Uh, and I think they have a better claim because if, and I still think there are inconsistencies between the early church and much of Eastern theology, but they don't have the same kinds of dogmas that are so radically divorced from the early church that Rome does. So if you're, if you're going to look at one of those traditions and say which one looks more like the early church, I think the East wins that battle hands down. I'm not telling you to go East, <laughs> uh, please. Uh, I think there are reasons not to, but... Um, but what Rome is basically going to say is it's, it's all about the authority of the Pope. And so what Rome's concern is is not so much tradition as such as it really is the office of the papacy. And the office of the papacy, that's what the Eastern Church is missing for them. And that's why the East can't claim some kind of you know, infallible authority in the way that, that Rome can. Because for them, really, the Church stands or falls with the office of the Pope. Roman Catholicism is really entirely dependent on the office of the papacy. If you reject the historical claims of the office of the papacy, the whole system just crumbles. Um, so I, in some ways, I think it's not really the authority of tradition as such. It's really just the authority of the pope that they're relying on. Yeah. Um, but the other thing, the Eastern Church doesn't have, because they don't have something like the papacy, they don't have the same kind of system in place that they can continue to have ecumenical councils. Right? So for the East, you've got the seven and that's it. They don't need to have further councils, partially because the church isn't united anymore. Rome says, well, I don't care. We've got the Pope, so we can keep doing whatever we want, and it counts as you know, authoritative for everybody. Um, so that's, that's the argument, at least. How do you fit uh, marriage between same gender into this uh, scripture uh, versus uh, tradition? Um, yeah, uh, so you're talking about same-sex marriage. How does that fit into this? Um, I would say same-sex marriage has no basis in scripture or tradition. Um, it's a complete novelty in, in terms of both. There's no, I mean, the biblical testimony, I think, is quite quite clear about the nature of marriage from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation, and Revelation has, uses marriage imagery significantly in terms of Christ's relationship to the church. I don't think there's any idea that there's anything like that that's acceptable scripturally. Um, but it's also not, I mean, it's not fan of tradition. You, you can't really make an argument for it based on one or the other. I mean, it's, it's a, though certainly homosexual relations have existed for as long as humanity has almost. The, the notion that that would, somehow be identified with marriage is just a complete novelty. So I guess how it fits into this discussion would be um, sola scriptura means that scripture is our authority over whatever culture says, right? It's our moral authority over um, whatever our feelings may want us to think uh, or feel. Can a doctrinal disagreement between Protestants be a challenge to Sola Scriptura? And if so, what kind of disagreement? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I, and I understand the argument, and this is something you're often going to hear is, well, Sola Scriptura doesn't really work because, hey, you've got all of these different, like, Protestants and all of them believe in Sola Scriptura and none of them agree on anything. So what the heck is the use of Sola Scriptura? Uh, which, I, I, I get the argument, and, and I think, first of all, I think we can say it is an issue that we have among Protestants that we have so much division. I think denying the issue and just pretending everything is fine is a bad way to deal with it because that's often what I see with Roman Catholic apologists doing. Because if I point to them, if I say, and this is part of my response to you, is Rome is a divided mess. You guys don't agree on anything. You guys don't agree on morals. You don't agree on theology. You don't agree on uh, worship. But you all just are under the same bishop. And so you call it unity, even though half of you like hate the current pope and <laughs> uh, like and disagree with almost everything he says and disobey all of the things he tells you to do and find a loophole to do it. So uh, I think they have the same division problem we do. They just have the ecclesiastical structure that they're not divided in the way that we are. Um, 
and what I don't want to do is give this like rosy impression. Well, of course, if you just have the Bible, you all come to all the same conclusions. I don't think that's the case. Um, well, I think there we have to ask first ask the question, how many churches are there that actually are functioning on a sola scriptura principle in a classical sense? And the Roman Catholic apologists like to throw around this number that there are 33,000 Protestant denominations. Uh, it's, it's an absolutely ridiculous number. It's totally inflated. They're including, um, you know, the Watchtower Society, like the Jehovah's Witness groups. They're including Mormons. They're including Sede Vacantist Roman Catholic breakoff groups as Protestants. Uh, they include megachurches as their own Protestant denominations. Like, it, it's a completely ridiculous inflated number. There are not 33,000 Protestant denominations. The reality is that when you're looking at all of these church bodies and you ask the question of who is actually functioning on a classical Protestant idea of sola scriptura, I don't think there is nearly as much division as you'd think. So, first of all, I'd say those churches that are, uh, that well, don't believe the infallibility of the word of God. Like if you have churches that um, say will reject the teachings of Paul on gender and sexuality, those are not Protestant churches because they reject the Sola Scriptura principle because it's not their authority. So they, they shouldn't be counted as Protestants in any sense. If you believe that there is a change to the word of God that your experience or rationality can uh, determine truth outside of scripture or over and above scripture, you are not a Protestant in a classical sense at all. Uh, that would be identified with the group called the Socinians that the Lutherans consistently loved to write against. It's like the one time that the Lutherans and Reformed liked each other was when they were bashing the Socinians together. Um, so uh, you, those are not Protestants. Those churches that reject the tradition altogether and reject the creeds, they're not functioning on Sola Scriptura either because a classical Sola Scriptura is not that Bible alone in every possible sense. So if you're going to boil down who are the actual Protestants, you basically have three groups that are functioning on those principles. You have Lutherans, you have Anglicans, and then you have the Reformed. And by the Reformed, I really mean um, you know, the Dutch Reformed or the uh, Confessional Presbyterians. Um, you know, the Baptists, to some degree, uh, would probably fall under that. They come out of the Reformed tradition. Um, there are Baptists who, I would say, function basically within a historic Protestant approach to Sola Scriptura, but there are many who I think don't. So, I mean, I know many of you are probably familiar with Gavin Ortland. He's, I, I would not consider him a Protestant, even though he's a Baptist. I think he, because I think he functions probably along similar lines. Um, even there, though, I do think that there are some differences between the Lutheran Reformed in terms of how, exactly how the pieces fit together. Um, but I, I do think that when you basically boil everything down, you have basically three to four groups that are actually functioning on the Sola Scriptura principle that I would consider classical Protestants. And when you look at those groups, yeah, there are significant differences, but it's not on every doctrine. And those differences are no greater than the differences between Roman Catholics. So that's my response here. Um, but I think th the main issue is that Rome wants to see unity just in the sense of um, ecclesiastical unity. Like we have the same... We're all under the same bishop, okay? So my church body, like I'm in the AALC, American Association of Lutheran Churches, uh, we, have, we have our own bishop who is not the bishop of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, another American church body that we're in full fellowship with. Right? I preach at their churches. They come, you know, preach at, at our churches. We have a great relationship with each other. Uh, Rome would say we're divided, we just have a different bishop. Like, it doesn't mean we're divided. So I think the way that we're talking about unity is, is different too. Okay, and we'll take, I know it's been just about an hour here, but we'll take one more question and then I'll, I'll close here so I don't keep you too long. Uh, as far as I've understood, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, yeah. Augustine, Augustine uh, yeah. talked, had the notion of the two books, uh, the Bible and, and, and the nature. Sure. How, how does that relate to, to uh, this concept of... of uh, ah, yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, so Augustine, and this is the distinction that pretty much everybody follows, too, that, yeah, Augustine speaks about these two books of, of revelation, right? There's the supernatural revelation we have in Scripture, and there's the book of nature. And God has revealed himself in both of these things. Uh, and I would say to that, amen. I think Augustine's exactly right. What he's talking about there is not that there is some kind of... 
authoritative teaching that can be gained just by nature that would say anything that you know contradicted to or added doctrine to the word of God. This is just the understanding that we have both natural revelation and we have special revelation. So that looking at natural revelation, we can find out all sorts of things that are true about God. Uh, I think that there are places for arguments for the existence of God just by looking at nature. Paul does this in Romans 1. Um, just by looking at nature, we can come up with moral claims. There's just the nature of the conscience, which is created by God. So uh, those kinds of things, I think, are what is, what is meant by Augustine there. Those are not things that are additional to or not taught in the word of God. And that, that's the main difference, I think, there. Uh, so what, what he's not going to do is say, well, you can just use your reason and add extra dogma or something to, to scripture. That would, be, that would be a problem. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.